by request, I'm going to be doing 15 minute versions of my full lectures. And this one is chapter one and two, and let's get started. When we are looking at our objectives, this is what I'm gonna hit in the 15 minute version. If you want the full version, head on over to that video and I will um, link it above. So when we're looking at the history of childbirth in the last hundred years, we've gone from a very natural, non-technological environment, a lot of babies being born at home, and then we moved into a very medical um, environment where the babies are now being born in the hospital and became very provider-centric. And then in the 60s and 70s, we saw kind of a reawakening of choice and uh, babies, uh, women wanting to have their babies their way and uh, fully uh, be present for the experience. And then um, as we continue on through the 80s and 90s, we saw higher um, technological influence again, lots of interventions, lots of epidural. Then we moved into the uh, elective induction causing uh, labor to happen when it's not quite ready for a non-medical reason or not, it, it isn't happening on its own for a non-medical reason. And we have um, seen increased maternal mortality rates because of this, we, which is an embarrassment to our nation. Uh, this is um, looking back at the, at the traditional midwives that had a lot of knowledge that unfortunately didn't get passed on. And this slide is representing the twilight sleep that happened from 1915 to 1960-ish or so, where women were given scopolamine and large doses of um, uh, medication narcotics, to, and they didn't remember the experience. Then here is our uh, uh, nod to the 60s and 70s when they started taking it back. Ina Mae Gaskin implores us to um, recognize that our bodies are not a lemon. It's profitable to scare women about birth and we're the only species in the mammal that doubts our ability. Here we are today, very complex, increased technology, threats of litigation, care under uh, time constraints and economic restraints, especially with the nursing crisis. Modern day hospital delivery room, is what it might look like. Um, our cesarean rate is uh, about one in four women in the lowest risk category will have a cesarean. Uh, the World Health Organization recommends less than 15%. For all births, we're at one in three women that are having a major surgery as a cesarean delivery. And our, we have the most expensive um, uh, childbirth in the world. It is the most expensive in the United States. And we have some of the worst maternal mortality rates surrounding that expense. What we are making a concerted effort throughout the United States to decrease that mortality rate. And these slides, you can pause the video here and read through them. You can see why our mortality rate is higher and some of the things that we're hoping to do to address that. One of the big reasons for the increased mortality rate for specific groups of people probably is related to unconscious bias or implicit bias. And I urge you to spend more time looking at this concept. We don't use as many midwives as the rest of the world. And that may be uh, contributing to our high intervention and high mortality rate. Here, the, the government has put out an initiative to help train more midwives and um, pay for more midwives. And I implore you to go and look at this document. Other factors that are going to affect our maternal and child health is culture we, and society and the influence that we have from social media. Um, we also have the empowerment or lack thereof of um, the healthcare consumer and uh, letting them know that they do have choice and they have a right to um, make those choices. Some of the things that we wanna do are um, uh, increase the healthcare consumers' uh, healthcare literacy, letting them know what the options are, having respect for individual decisions that they may be making based on their own um, ideology. Definite barriers, finances, 
socio-cultural barriers. And our job as a nurse is to assess for these things and help to uh, level that playing field and help those that do have disparities. Social media influence can influence an entire uh, section of our population. Entire generations have been influenced by social media. Everything you read or hear on the internet about medicine specifically is not always true. And we have some significant dangers and things that have changed in our society, like the um, resurgence of measles and polio and pertussis, and um, just to name a few, because of the dangers that were put out there by um, unverified uh, information about uh, medical things like the dangers of vaccines. Well, we need to teach people to apply the CRAP test and we as um, uh, leaders in healthcare need to apply the CRAP test to everything that we read. And we need to look at how current it is, um, how recently it was updated. Is someone being paid to put that information out there? Is it reliable? Does the author provide references? Does the author have any experience in that field? Um, is, who's the publisher? Um, are, is there advertisement on that page? Are they trying to convince you of something? What is the intent? Is it fact or opinion based? And by using this kind of test that we use to look at everything, we can start to determine is it fake or fact. You want to know the categories that fit in your primary prevention. These are all your primary prevention activities. It's a great NCLEX question. They also, you want to know what fits in your secondary prevention and your tertiary prevention. So know how to separate those categories. Our role is to provide anticipatory guidance and education. That's one of our biggest roles as nurses. We wanna provide reliable evidence-based resources, not based on opinion, not based on previous experience. Lots of legal and ethical issues in maternal and child health. Um, you have the whole abortion issue, substance abuse while pregnant, interuterine therapy, and then looking at the concept of maternal and fetal conflict. If um, the fetus can't survive without the mom, but the fetus is um, involved in a disease process that might um, eventually kill the mother, then we have to look at those um, that conflict between those two. And that's a whole class in itself. Informed consent for the most part is um, 18 years old. And when we're looking at informed consent, we, our job as a nurse is to, we're serving as a witness to the signature process of informed consent, but we're also determining if they understand what they're signing. So in order to be able to give informed consent, the um, patient needs to be given the reason for whatever procedure is being offered, the risks of that procedure, the alternatives of that procedure, and our job as a nurse is just to make sure that they understand it. If they don't understand it, we got to go back to the provider and make sure that that information is um, given to that patient before they sign that consent. That's the 15 minute short version. And we're going to call these NCLEX notes. These are the big, big overreaching concepts. If you want the full lecture, head over to that hour long lecture. <laughs>